Hello and welcome to this first episode of Performing Labor. My name is Rob Simons, and I am your host. Each episode features an interview with an accomplished performing musician who is doing interesting and creative work from within performing arts institutions and outside of them. We'll unpack their training, their practice, and their careers, how they got started, how they stay sharp, and their ambitions for the future. My hope is this podcast will provide value no matter where you are in your musical journey. If you're thinking about a career in music, if you're in music school now, a recent graduate, a working musician yourself, or if you're a music lover and just curious to know more. For this first episode, I sat down with Mark Dix to talk about his more than two decades of music making and community building. Mark joined the Phoenix Symphony in 1995 and founded the Downtown Chamber Series in 2000. Mark is a thoughtful musician, an extraordinarily capable organizer, a dedicated teacher, a cultural ambassador, and an artist citizen. For his outreach work through the Phoenix Symphony, Mark was awarded the 2017 Ford Musician Award of Excellence in Community Service. This award reflected Mark's leadership in expanding the symphony's impact in health and wellness and education. In 2019, his concert series, the Downtown Chamber Series, was awarded the Mayor's Arts Award by Phoenix Mayor Kate Gallego for its quote, innovation, impact, and integration. In this interview, Mark shares some great advice and wisdom on a variety of career topics. Building a successful concert series of your own, making the most out of music school, the orchestra audition process, the learning curve of the first few seasons in a full-time orchestra, and some strategies on maintaining a high level over a long career. I first met Mark when I joined the Phoenix Symphony in 2004, and in the decade plus since I left that orchestra, we continue to be what I might call semi-annual collaborators. He brings great enthusiasm and imagination to artistic endeavors, but what makes Mark unique is he backs up these qualities with an unflappable tenacity to overcome logistical obstacles, anywhere from negotiating people problems to fixing a broken cooling system. In this conversation, the Colorado Springs native describes his younger self as a quote, grass in the teeth westerner with a mullet. He's come a long way from those days, but he still embodies a fix anything ethos. If you see a deficit or a problem in your community or your institution, get to work fixing it. Please enjoy this conversation. Mark Dix, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for making time and it is good to see you, man. So we have a lot to get to tonight and I'm excited to unpack all these different elements that make up your career. But we're recording this in late April, 2020 and we're all about six weeks into cancel concerts. So we could obviously talk all day about what our respective institutions are doing and how they're weathering the coronavirus, but I don't want to get too bogged down, bogged down in that, but I also don't want to pretend like it's not happening either. So can you give me a little bit of a bird's eye view on where the Phoenix Symphony is now in terms of ad- adaptation? Let's start it out very abruptly. We were laid off uh, March 12th, and uh, right before we had a three-day run of some Disney pop shows that are a big moneymaker for us and a big cash outlay as well, uh, to hire their services. So it was a tough call and uh, the state had just really over a three day period had gone from cinching down how, what our audience sizes needed to be to the point that uh, we had to close up. Uh, we really were at a point that uh, we had to stop payroll right away. And a third of the staff was laid off as well. So uh, it was got real fast and uh, at that point, Uh, collected unemployment and uh, a lot of organizing at the union level right away amongst my colleagues, uh, really high level of engagement online, email, uh, cell phone, et cetera, to just chart a path. And uh, that level of connectivity is something that was really indicative of being in a union orchestra where if I was a freelancer or if I was in a different type of music business, it would have been such an isolating feeling to be uh, unable to perform and out of work uh, with no one to really talk to. So um, a lot of connectivity. And at that point, uh, our longstanding relationship with our board of directors that had really built up in recent years, uh, we ended up really having a really strong board and a lot of connection between musicians and the board. And so we were able to pull off uh, getting one of the small business 
uh, loans from the government. And we got in by the deadline, got the paperwork in, and were able to get the whole orchestra back on payroll uh, for the final seven weeks of our season, which was a big accomplishment. So with that accomplishment, now we had the marching orders all back on payroll, but still at home of what we were going to do as an organization. And so we've launched into this digital campaign that just started this week. Yeah, it's really exciting, man, because you guys, you guys, before the shutdown, there was some new uh, and exciting news about a new CEO. Do you feel that in some ways, obviously, we're disconnected from each other physically, um, but in some ways, at least from my own experience, the orchestra feels very connected. I mean, just we're, we're always talking to each other um, via text message, phone calls, but also these Zoom meetings. And I was surprised at how quickly we sprung into action and how, how everyone kind of knew their roles in some ways. Did you kind of feel something similar to that? Absolutely. Um, obviously, there's every orchestra, like every group of people has a certain sect of people that are very heavy into volunteerism. And uh, those folks tend to be the ones that are on the committees and the most engaged. So, uh, but those folks were really sprung into action immediately. And still though, uh, difficult to be as disconnected as we are, not performing together. um, And outside of a handful of 10 people that are doing a lot of organizing, the bulk of the orchestra is still quite isolated. So. Yeah. So, I was doing a radio show earlier today with my former boss and Teddy Abrams. And he, he mentioned that he thought that despite all the disaster that surrounds us, that something might good come from this in terms of like the greater world, but more specifically that there's an opportunity to get really stubborn things unstuck about our own business. Like there is an opportunity for arts organizations to find new ways to create public value and better serve or differently serve perhaps their communities um, and find new ways for connection. Do, the, do you think this social media or the media campaign that you described, is that think align with that sentiment at all? Absolutely. Uh, we're, we do so many concerts a year, 200 plus concerts a year with all of our education, pops, classics, special engagements uh, that in a normal week, working six days a week, there's so many performances that, there's a whole host of issues that we never tend to. We talk about them in meetings, uh, the desire to do digital campaigns, uh, connect with our donors to, to really have a level of gratitude that we're really thanking the people who have done so much for the organization uh, to be the, the community partner that we want to be. Uh, but it often just doesn't happen. We're short staffed like all arts organizations and the musicians are spread thin. Uh, so yes, uh, this is definitely an opportunity to do a lot of work that we normally would never have time to do. That's an interesting turn of phrase, the uh, community partnerships. And that's a good place, I think, to pivot off this into what I think is the most interesting part of your work. And I mean, look, man, we've known each other, we've known each other a long time, to put it generously. And uh, together we produce a lot of projects that I would rank as career highlights. But I want to get to know a little bit more in depth about how and why you got started building the Downtown Chamber Series way back in 2000 um, on top of your symphony job. So what prompted you to take on all that effort back then? Well, uh, after climbing the mountain of getting an orchestra job, which I didn't think I was guaranteed to get, I was always very well aware of the competitive level of my chosen field and uh, was very humble about the fact that I might not be able to break through and win a a pro orchestra job. But I gave myself a timeline to do it and was successful in getting a job right outside of my master's. But once here, uh, quickly was struck by all the things that were possible in my city that were not happening. And it was not uh, anything negative about Phoenix. On the contrary, I saw nothing but opportunity here, but it was more a process of realizing all the things that weren't happening in my industry as a classical musician. Things I experienced in U Symphony, things I experienced in undergrad, 
uh, in Tacoma, Washington, things I experienced in grad school in Manhattan School Music, and then things I experienced here, um, all which led me to believe that there were a lot of paths that had been trodden that were not working in regards to engaging with the community in a really genuine way uh, and using the idiom of chamber music. I think it's worth pointing out that the downtown Phoenix um, of 2000 is not the hip place it is now. And there was a lot of construction and repairs that went into getting those venues uh, ready for audiences in some ways that played to your strengths. I mean, is, was that part of the allure? I grew up in the West. I grew up in Colorado and then I uh, went to undergrad in Tacoma, Washington. And so when I went to New York City, um, let's just say I arrived with a mullet, <laughs> so, you know, raised on heavy metal and, uh, and then grunge out in the Seattle area. And so in short, um, the East Coast was very important part of my training for a whole host of reasons and things we can talk about more if you are, are interested. But uh, specifically to your question, uh, Phoenix, I'm, I'm sorry, I lost you there. No, no, it's, it's just that so, I was thinking about that the Phoenix of 2000 is a very different place than it is now. Oh, sorry, and right. In terms of changing, got it. Uh, making an impact, making a dent in your community, the fact that you could get in there and not just scrub toilets, but like rebuild stuff. I was just wondering if that was part okay. of the allure. Got it. 20, yeah, 20 lost, years ago. <clears throat> yeah, I lost my train of thought. Because I'm from the West, grew up in Colorado, um, had that sort of Western spirit of needing to build things all the time. So, yes, I uh, was excited about getting a job in Phoenix because everything didn't feel built where I had to basically come in and be part of something massive and already finished, which ha the East Coast has that sense to me or it did to me at that time so phoenix in 1995 had a significant skyline it was a major city one of the bigger biggest cities in the west um, however the downtown area where the symphony performed basically had high rises for offices and at night everything shut down a lot of vacant lots a lot of empty space <clears throat> so once I became interested in getting chamber music, doing the whole thing differently, not having concerts in concert halls, not having them in wealthy neighborhoods, not having them in churches just because they have a nice piano. Um, and I started looking at the places that interested me, which were these amazing small warehouses and galleries in downtown Phoenix. Yes, those places were in Phoenix because of blight, because the rent was cheap and the artists could move in and have those spaces as their own. Uh, so absolutely, if I had come to Phoenix now, uh, downtown Phoenix is not blighted, downtown Phoenix is very high rent, but I still today would be able to find that visual arts community and in some ways, the same thing would have been able to happen because even in a community that has higher rent, there's tons of empty space, tons of corporate buildings that aren't being used yet, and an adventurous uh, truffle pig arts interpreter, <laughs> entrepreneur like myself can um, come into a city and make it work. Yeah. So would you say, I mean, I was there for some of this renaissance. Um, but would you say that that turnaround was arts driven? It was arts and education driven from my perspective. Is that, is that your assessment? The turnaround of the city? Yeah, in downtown specifically. I think so for two reasons. Uh, one, every major positive change comes from individuals. It doesn't come from ideas. Ideas are cheap. Lots of people have them. There's books written about how to do everything we would like to do better. But they actually come into being from individuals in our cities that really have, have it together in the community partnerships to make it work. So Kimber Lanning, who 
1995, ran Modified Arts and then went on to run uh, Local First Arizona, which is a major nonprofit in the state now to uh, promote local businesses. Very influential and uh, amazing woman who her presence, along with a host of other gallery owners, they were all doing their own projects, but in a really vibrant way, were the people that made it possible for someone like me to come in, engage with them, and build a new project. Uh, the second reason would be uh, real estate. Uh, the Cardinals football team, when they came to Arizona, they uh, wanted to build a stadium and they wanted to build it in downtown Phoenix. That's where we had recently built <clears throat> the stadium for uh, the, the baseball team, the Diamondbacks. And uh, it was in an area that was somewhat called blighted, a lot of empty space, a lot of old galleries, old houses. And that's the footprint where they were gonna put that stadium. And because of the Kimber Lannings and the other uh, arts community that was so well-rooted at that point through First Fridays, which at that point was the largest Friday art walk in the country, um, the pushback was so heavy to building a football stadium and covering all that area in a parking lot for an area that would have 12 games a season that instead they built the stadium way out in the suburbs. So those would be the two reasons that really, um, I think would answer your question that yes, it was arts driven. Yeah. And so when you were talking about real estate and the sort of the empty spaces and some of the blight in downtown, one of the interesting things about your business model, so to speak, is that you do kind of take the audience on a journey of the different art spaces in downtown. Was that like from the beginning of the inception of the idea that you would yeah. have a, like a host and did you develop those and did you have a pre-existing relationship with those, with those presenters, not the presenters, but the, the gallery owners? No, but, uh, well, the first question, yes, I most definitely wanted diversity to be, to be built into the series. I felt that many musical environments I'd been involved with or chamber music projects uh, were, some of them were great, but many of them were in essence, uh, what you would call in the arts world, a vanity gallery, a gallery where you're just showing your paintings. Uh, and many string quartets and other chamber music uh, entities function that way, where it's the same group of people performing on their series every show. So wanted to, this to have diversity built in so that the audience wasn't just going to be seeing string quartet or just woodwinds or just brass or just harpsichord or just piano that it would really be mixed up. And uh, so that it had to have built in diversity with musicians that the same musicians were not performing every concert and they weren't performing in the same combinations. Uh, and also the spaces most definitely would be uh, different galleries each time we did obviously repeat a lot of the spaces we go back to, but the exhibits are always new. Mm -hmm. So let's, so you mentioned being from the West and so let's turn the dial back a little bit and talk about growing up in Colorado Springs and what was your musical life as, like as a kid growing up in Colorado Springs? Colorado Springs, I think it still is. Uh, a small, like Flagstaff, Arizona sized town, you know, less than 300,000 people when I lived there, <clears throat> but had their own symphony uh, with this uh, short season. They had their own youth symphony, um, great teachers. So, and Colorado College. So, there were really in the downtown area, there were lots of resources for a, a student that was studying music. My family specifically were kind of outliers. They were uh, Renaissance. <laughs> My dad was a real Renaissance man. So our days were filled uh, mixing cement, building a new wall, uh, gardening, uh, building onto the house, constant, constant projects in a neighborhood that was made up of a lot of Frank Lloyd Wright influenced houses houses that were uh, designed or influenced by Frank Lloyd Wright's uh, granddaughter. So the ethos of a home that's built into the land, not on top of it, and everything that comes with that in our daily life, uh, 
yes, I was practicing music, but it was usually the last thing I got to after everything else that I was doing. <laughs> sure. So you mentioned a whole bunch of um, important institutions in Colorado Springs. I mean, were you seeing a lot of concerts? Yes. We went to every Colorado Springs symphony concert. I don't know. They probably had a season of about eight shows a year. Um, plus the things I was doing as a student. So yes. And my dad was a classical music aficionado. So it was always blasting in the house and the TV had to be off up until seven o'clock at night. Do you think that the size of Colorado Springs, the, the relative smallness of it, uh, meant that you saw growing up that you saw like that individuals could make a difference on a, like a smaller playing field? Most definitely. Yeah. I think the, um, and my, uh, training was indicative of that where I was able to be at that point I was playing violin and viola, but I was able to be concert master of the youth symphony, which is a big accomplishment in our town by the time I was in high school. And, uh, but felt like I was a big fish in that town. But then when I had an opportunity through the music union, uh, there was something called Congress of strings, which was a, uh, national, uh, festival, held in the summer for six weeks where they would select two students, string students from each state in the country. And then they would all go to Congress of Strings for six weeks and work with great conductors. So I was one of the two Coloradans that got to go to that and, um, in uh, 1989. And it was really life-changing to be in an orchestra where I was surrounded by the two best kids from Illinois and New York and Florida and, and California played my first Mahler symphony at a really high level, or what I felt was a high level. And uh, that was when I really had the turning point of everyone had told me, well, Mark, you clearly love music, but you have a lot of skills. You know, music is a hard profession to go into uh, competitively and financially. So I, would have, I went into that festival saying, oh, I'm not going to go into music, but it'll always be part of my life. I exited that festival prior to starting undergrad, uh, absolutely set on trying to be an orchestral musician, although still pursuing an academic uh, education. And so you, how did you decide to go to Puget Sound? That was a function of wanting to get out of Colorado and away from my parents um, and wanting in a place, to be in a place that was different, a place that had volcanoes, that had the ocean, uh, temperate rainforest had a lot of environmental things that interested me that were different than Colorado, but still uh, the natural realm and some big exciting cities like Seattle. Uh, and my brother at that point was in school up there. And even though I uh, often wanted to take a different path than him, um, when I visited him, I was really uh, impressed with the music department and with the academic department at University of Puget Sound. It was a place where I thought I could do both. So when you, when you headed off to undergrad, I mean, a lot of, a lot of music students, maybe most music students, um, relative to our peers in other, in other fields are pretty advanced in terms of subject matter expertise. So, but there's still a really, really long way to go. <laughs> so tell me about like your undergrad experience. Like, where did you start? Where did you end? I mean, in terms of your, your playing and your, your practicing and your being organized and your, and your ideas about the business. I think the big stimulus was from a, a member of the viola faculty at that school. They had a great music faculty, but I was already at a fairly high level of utility in how I looked at my career that so much of our life has to do with where we are when. And I'd chosen to go to University of Puget Sound and it was a great school for me. I did a lot of environmental work there. Um, environmental activism, ran a huge organization, ran all the waste management and all that stuff for recycling, had academics that I was really engaged in, and, you know, international politics and geology. And the music department had, was solid, but the viola students were going places. They were doing audition training. They were doing mock auditions. They were really speaking the language of preparing for orchestral careers whereas the other music students were basically working on their concertos and their sonatas and with their teachers. And uh, the drive that I saw in the viola teacher impressed me. And so I switched over to viola completely at that point, even though I was playing violin in the Tacoma Symphony, I was still doing both. Uh, but the career path that 
that teacher exhibited. And she was a, there is a, a violist up in the Seattle area, the ballet, uh, Pacific Northwest Ballet, and knew the audition circuit. And so that was the stimulus. So I would say being flexible in undergrad to really watch the students that are going places, watch what teachers they're working with, and make what adjustments you may need to, uh, to be part of that path. Did she point you to New York City and to uh, Manhattan School for your next step, or did you decide that on your own? I think she had uh, her eyes on University of Maryland because there was a viola teacher, uh, Roberto Diaz, who was there, who, who she was hoping I would work with. Um, and I did audition there, um, but I was very set on going to a place that was very different yet again. I needed to be in the crucible of the East Coast as a West Coast or as a Western kid. Um, had a mullet at that point. <laughs> I, I had a lot of, I needed to get some grass out of my teeth. And I, and I admitted that. So I needed to uh, get to New York City. And even though I figured it would be, have some sacrifices, not being in as a place like University of Maryland or Cleveland or other schools where you were more in an enclave or Indiana, um, I wanted, I knew I had a small amount of time. I had at that point in my life in my undergrad, I had lost my brother and my father and I was already keenly aware uh, to a sudden death uh, events. And I was keenly aware of the fact that life is very short and that I've only got a small amount of time to make up a lot of ground. I thought of myself as a solid musician, but I was keenly aware of what competition I would be up against on the audition circuit and that I, that those two years of grad school were like an Olympic training, Olympic training center. I uh, had no time to waste. So I chose uh, Manhattan School of Music because it had an orchestral performance master's program. I didn't have to take piano coursework. I didn't have to take a lot of other sort of subsidiary music classes, which are all valuable courses, but they weren't part of that specific goal of mine to get into an orchestra. And uh, it was a very good choice on my part. So it really wasn't anything different. It was actually in the kind of the same funnel. You were just probably moving faster. Yes. Yeah. Interesting. And when you were in New York, did you, did you take in like some of the culture of the city or were you just so focused on what you were doing? I think I took in the culture more than most of my colleagues did, uh, which I would say was the same in undergrad as well. <laughs> um, in the sense that when I got there, I, Everyone told me, oh, well, you have to ride the subway, you have to take cabs, and this is where you need to live. And I quickly figured out that the places where all the students were living were pretty rough and expensive. And, um, and so I decided to, I checked out some neighborhoods that seemed much better. And uh, those were, I put up a flyer on the, on the, basically on posts on the street up in uh, Washington Heights. And elderly people, basically, who were interested in me being there to take care of a few things and have a room to rent. So I, that way I could sort of audition them <laughs> and pick the one that was the best fit. And getting a bicycle, getting away from uh, the trains. Uh, they were surprisingly slow. Bicycle was faster. And uh, then that opened up the whole city. I could get in my practice time, do my coursework, my rehearsals, and still make it down to Carnegie or Lincoln Center to catch as many concerts as possible. And the partnership that Manhattan had with um, the New York Philharmonic through the Orchestral Performance Masters um, made that whole process even more fluid. And I was able to catch a whole lot of stuff. Could you have ever seen yourself staying there? Or was that just so not a part of your plan? Well, when I, after I graduated, um, I, I began to see the opportunities that were opening up for freelancing, but it looked arduous. Uh, the wedding gigs, uh, I mean, you were lucky if you got a Broadway gig because it paid well, but the repetition of the Broadway repertoire and uh, the freelancing scene of working with conductors that were often not at the highest level, Pay hey, wasn't great, you know, going all the way out to Queens or New Jersey or wherever you needed to go to get to, to play a gig. And it felt professional to be freelancing in a city like Manhattan, but um, it's not something I wanted to do for long. 
and I wanted to get a job. I was working with Cindy Phelps uh, as a private teacher. And once I graduated, I was taking care of, I was nannying her, uh, her daughter. I would babysit her so that I could um, get free lessons. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't have kids. I love kids, but I had never done it before. And uh, there's a great story there where she said, oh, Mark, yeah, you can, you're good with kids. I said, yeah, okay, I'll watch your daughter. So for lessons, fantastic, great. So I did that a few times, no big issue. But pretty soon, I think two weeks in, she said, oh, a bunch of friends from the New York Phil are having a party at my house and I would love to have you come and if you could watch the kids in the basement while we have the party upstairs. That way all the kids are there, but there's uh, an adult to watch them. I said, no problem. So I, I got to her small bungalow in New Jersey and in the basement, I think there were 11 kids and I was the only uh, one in charge. Uh, one of them was severely autistic and uh, it was one of the scariest evenings of my life. No one got hurt. Everything went fine upstairs. The New York Philharmonic had a great party and I didn't get fired. Outstanding. Uh, <laughs> so so before, before you got to the Phoenix Symphony, did you take a lot of auditions? I, uh, while I was at Manhattan, I think I took a couple. And then uh, once I, I think I'd only, I think Phoenix was only my third audition. Um, but the, uh, the audition I won in Phoenix was only for a one year spot initially. Mm -hmm. So I continued to audition. So once I got to Phoenix, I, I took many more auditions uh, with Phoenix as my base. The main issue with staying in New York City that was a challenge was when you're working freelancing, you really don't have time to practice and it's a very difficult hand to mouth life. And so I actually decided to take an office job so that I knew I would have a 40 hour week. I knew I would have money and that way I could focus on working with Cindy Phelps and uh, preparing for auditions. And I was, you know, I was 25 at that time. I gave myself a five year window that if I didn't have a job by age 30, I was going to do something else. Uh, so. And did you see yourself staying in New York City until you were 30? Yes, if I needed to. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I felt like it was the best place to be because uh, I had proximity to uh, Phelps and I had um, freelancing opportunities and I was really in the crucible. After you got the full-time or the, the tenure track position in Phoenix, did you think to yourself, I'm back in the Mountain West, I'm home, like this is it? I did. I think... Uh, I missed the climate of Colorado, but I never was picky about that. I love the sun. And so, yes, I really felt like the West is where I needed to be. And I felt like maybe I'm being overly self-deprecating, but I feel like having taken a lot of auditions after I got to Phoenix, you know, at the Metropolitan Opera, all over the place, Minnesota Orchestra. And I, I showed well in those places overall, but I felt like I ended up where I'm supposed to be, a Western... Uh, upbringing in a Western city in an orchestra that was professional level, but not metropolitan opera and a place that had an orchestra that had a lot of opportunities in the community for growth and that nothing was going to hold me back. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that time, those first few years in the job are really interesting. I mean, I think back to my time in the Richmond symphony and all that I learned doing that. I mean, you're, your technique is probably the best level it's been to that point, but your experience level is a little underdeveloped and for obvious reasons. And a lot of people eye is on the next lat rung the ladder. It's kind of a strange set of ingredients. I mean, did you, what do you remember from those years in terms of your growth as an artist and as a professional? The years being the first few uh, years in the Phoenix symphony. I remember being overwhelmed by, the amount of music and the speed of which it passed by our stand. And uh, some of that preparation though was Manhattan School of Music did a fantastic job of because they had a schedule where you'd get the new music on Tuesday and you're, and you're performing it on Friday. So three days, four days of rehearsals and then boom, concerts. So a lot of repertoire was passing through this by the stand uh, in Manhattan, which was also a big shock coming from undergrad, uh, but helped really prepare me for what it would be like in a job. I think uh, the main thing was how to not overpractice. The sense that I needed to look at every page, that I needed to 
be aware of uh, anything, any, every difficult part that I had to own it in order to hold my weight at rehearsal. And uh, what ended up happening was repetitive strain, which also had kind of built up during my under, undergrad and graduate uh, years of just practicing being highly, highly disciplined uh, to a fault, pushing my body uh, to, a, to a fault. I'm still doing that now. I'm just doing it more with plumbing, electrical, and roofing <laughs> on my old house. <laughs> but you've probably got uh, but, a pretty good system dialed in in terms of monitoring yourself. I do. I think for the most part is when you feel pain, it's for a reason. And uh, that when you, see, when you see those storm clouds, you start rowing the other direction and making adjustments in practice regimen, um, in stress level, um, in duration, in how my approach to the instrument. Um, so absolutely, the way you swing a hammer uh, really matters as far as repetitive strain. Uh, but if you've got a lot of nails to hit, it's still um, going to hurt. And uh, a professional orchestr orchestral schedule for a section string player is relentless. You know, we're playing the Beethoven and we're also playing the Doc Severinsen pop stuff. I mean, there's no days off. Um, whereas in some instruments, there's, there's breaks based on repertoire. So it's a relentless schedule. And I think learning how to only practice what's necessary and be relaxed at rehearsal, regardless how stressed out the conductor may be, um, and saving, knowing when to, uh, when to unleash. Uh, you mean saving for the show? Yeah, or, or just even the scope of a piece. Um, that um, there's, I mean, the viola is an instrument that's internal. So if we are having a, a complex about not being heard and we are just laying into the string uh, continuously, uh, it really builds up in the arms. And next thing you know, you've got tennis elbow or a host of other issues. Mm -hmm. So knowing when to save. In the course of a piece, in the course of a concert, in the course of a week, in the course of a career. When do you feel like you actually got a handle on that? Like where, how many years into the job when you thought I've got a system and that system works? Uh, pretty late. <laughs> probably, um, probably 10 to 15 years into the job. That's what I, I think. It, it, that's for me too. Yeah. I think it has to do with being aware of the power of moderation and that uh, learning how to moderate a non-moderate personality uh, is, uh, is, All right. is probably, you know. that's, uh, yeah, that, that's my experience too. I don't, I didn't only feel like, am I was in like a third job? I was about 35 when I started to realize like, Oh, this works. I can count on it from week to week this is going to be there for me if I do it this way. And I, in retrospect, I still sometimes can't believe it took that long. Um, all right. So going back to the mulleted, uh, hay in your teeth, Colorado, and I think about you coming to Phoenix and I think about you uh, setting up this, this series apart from your work. And what I think is interesting is that you were like super ahead of the curve in terms of what classical music was talking about but I'm pretty sure you didn't know that there was a curve to be ahead of. And, you know, as you've alluded to, you know, you're working really hard in terms of professionally, um, you're outside construction projects, your family. So you weren't reading classical music blogs and you weren't reading contemporary classical music blogs thinking, th thinking to yourself, I want to import this thing to Arizona. I mean, you built this thing in isolation. And, but I was thinking back while you're talking about the chamber series that when I got to Phoenix in about 04, the series was humming in terms of the number of concerts it was playing and the number of audience it was getting to. I mean, is it about, was it about the same size then it is, as it is now? Yes and no. I think from an audience standpoint, um, well, the first concert in 2000, April of 2000, I designed it to be sold out. Uh, because my, one of my big mantras was butts and seats. I was just exhausted, frustrated, even irate at the number of concerts I had participated in, um, either as an audience member or as a performer, 
that had so much that went into them in terms of the music and everything that needed to happen, but there was no one paying attention to their building an audience. So I uh, thought it had to do with scale. So picking a space that only held 70 people, a small gallery, but that the feeling you get coming into a room that's full. Uh, this is a very standard philosophy now. Concert halls all across the country manage their seats and their seating to create a sense of uh, audience fullness. community, full, fullness, yes. But in 95, that was not, or 2000, that was not talked about. So yeah, the first concert was sold out, but it was just one concert and it was 70 people. Now, uh, 20 years in, uh, we typically, when we have one program, we'll have two shows and each show will be about 190 people to 200 people. So um, big jump in the number of audience members that are coming to our concerts, but still trying to do it in spaces where 180 people is still like the sweet spot where it's not, it's small enough to be the people in the back row can still hear the string quartet, but big enough that you really feel like you're at an event. So but what I'm getting at though is you scaled it up super fast, like between 2000 before I met you and when I met you in 04 and 05 and started working with you, that, that model had basically been imprinted, like the two shows, full house, pretty big space. Yes, it did come pretty quick. Um, and it was with a lot of sweat. Like I said, I, um, because I believed in it not being a vanity project for one group of musicians. Uh, at this point, 20 years in, there's been 175 different musicians uh, have been featured on Downtown Chamber Series. So it's each program I was able to really rest on the ambitions of those musicians and the rep that they wanted to do. And then I took care of everything else, which would be the equivalent of putting on a wedding. <laughs> everything from the chairs, the staging, the lighting, the venue, um, the presentation, some food, some drink, and of course, publicity. Back then it was um, very grassroots. Downtown Phoenix has a lot of historic neighborhoods and they all, each one of them had their own newsletter. So I would, uh, by bike, go to each, the, the host house of each neighborhood or the editor who was, you know, somebody who would just do it on their home PC. And I would give them the press materials for the next concert. And then they would have a little article in their newsletter about the next concert coming up. Each one of those newsletters probably only generated two or three people, new people. Uh, but on top, multiply that times 10 newsletters, plus uh, doing stuff with print media, the newspaper, uh, the magazines that you would see at a coffee shop. So I put a lot of effort into grassroots print media uh, to make sure that people knew we were there. And spending five years doing that, and, and none of these people were people who typically would go to the symphony, the ballet, the opera. They were what I call culturally aware non-attenders, people who are mildly interested in art, music, architecture, and of course, getting out for an evening at an affordable price point. And so how do you reach those people? And uh, a lot of those people you just meet at the grocery store because you've got an instrument on your back and people are in line and if you're friendly, they say, oh, what's that? Next thing you know, I, I'll get them to come to a concert. So being an outgoing person, being very on the street in my town um, is how I really built up that, that steep curve. And for clarity too, I want you to talk a little bit about how hands-off you are on programming. <laughs> Maybe less hands off now than I used to be, but um, another frustration that came out of music school and working in large orchestras is the lack, the, the lack of empowerment that a musician can feel. <clears throat> you spend your career feeling very empowered to learn this hard music and then perform it and then win your audition or win your competition. And you can rest on those laurels. But once you're in a job, you really have no control of the rep that's chosen, very little of it. And it can be frustrating. Uh, so feeling like your artistic output from, for the rest of your career is being decided by someone else. So it's always been very important to me in this series that I want the audiences to come back. I want to attract them, first of all. And once they're there, I want them to feel something in the room that's compelling. And I can do that by having the room not be a church or a concert hall. 
in some remote neighborhood, but have it be an exciting warehouse that's got shipping paint and amazing art and sculpture and uh, trains going by on the next door. Um, and I can do it by the music on stage that the musicians are so energized with the repertoire that they selected uh, that they are bringing something that's really powerful. It's risky. You and I have uh, programmed a lot of pieces which we were very energized to do. Uh, we've done all, we've done five of the six part talk string quartets um, at varying levels of excellence. <laughs> um, but and the energy was really palpable to those audiences and our excitement for those pieces and what we talked about before we played them. But I think the audience probably would have appreciated, uh, you know, the Dvorak American string quartet more, uh, but it all became into the mix. And, yeah, and you sold those pretty hard. I mean, can you speak a little bit about the fluidity of programming in the sense that like there's something more to it more to the audience takeaway than just the, the music itself. So in other words, you know, you've created, you've got in the space, you've, and you've got the musicians that are fired up. You sell the program from the stage pretty hard, even if you're not playing. So those are all things that were deficits in classical music. And do you have a sense that when you add all those ingredients in, is that what makes it sticky? Yes. I mean, it's the, the analogy I use is figure skating. Uh, in the 1970s, I remember watching the Lake Placid Olympics, or uh, yeah, I think it's Lake Placid, 1976, and you basically would turn on your television set and watch just figure skating. Hardly any commentary, but just one contestant after another. And there's talking while they're skating, but that's about it. Jump ahead to today. If you went to see something on figure skating, there's a huge amount of time spent on the backstory of the skater uh, because people just are not connected to the sport enough to appreciate and really understand what it is. But once they have that backstory, uh, they're, they're sold. So the trick is how to do that. And I think um, I've had a lot of experience doing it through the series. And when I listen to how I did it, 20 years ago and how I do it now, it, it, I hope it's improved. I feel it has. Um, but it's also asking our colleagues uh, at these concerts to, yeah, I encourage you to please talk about the piece before we play. Some musicians, they don't want to talk at all. And some that do are following the same template they learned in grad school, which was, okay, you talk about the composer's background, what date, their major influences, and then the first movement is fast, the second movement is slow. But there's a lot of stuff that's not being talked about there, and a lot of it is the personal stuff. Why did you select this piece? Why did you decide to spend three months practicing it? What are the hardest things about rehearsing it? What are the things that you thought about in rehearsal? And so getting at those types of things, really the audiences are always excited to hear them, particularly so, yeah. in an intimate setting. The, um, the bar talks that we did are still pretty formative for me in terms of my playing and understanding like how far I had to go. I, I ranked that, that journey we went on um, over the course of many years uh, as pretty important for me. But I want to kind of shift a little bit to some of the other projects that we worked on. So it's more than a decade now, believe it or not, I think since we brought in the Low Anthem, which is like a, a loud but Americana acoustic band work with Joe Pug, Ben Salil, as you know, Toby Milford. I want um, you to talk a little bit about what surprised you about those processes, both artistically and logistically. Well, a, a beauty of chamber music that it's not amplified. So as long as there's enough light on the stage for the musicians to see their music, uh, which is, can be difficult in a warehouse that has no electricity, <laughs> but, uh, um, you're, you're, we're good to go. Uh, so bringing in a band where you've got a lot of chords, PA, um, very loud instruments like drums, but still wanting to have it to be a chamber music setting um, was very difficult. But like I do with everything, I, I just trust and give people a long leash of folks in my community that are really good at this stuff. At that point, there was a, a woman who worked at the... Um, Symphony as one of their crew and was just fantastic with all of this and she was in charge of all the sound and she worked with the sound crew of the low anthem when they came in 
And uh, I just had to make sure I st stood out of her way and made sure she had all the equipment rented that she needed. Um, so really uh, making sure to uh, utilize the skill sets of people in our city um, was, was really what made that float. Um, I think the biggest challenge logistically was, or not logistically, was the audience. Okay, you've had an audience that you've built up for a decade who's, who's seen a diversity of music ranging from Bartok to Mozart to Steve Reich and John Cage, but haven't had a, anybody in a band. Um, so how is that going to work? And so in our vision was to mesh the two. We had some Dagnani on that program. We had some Mozart and we had low anthem and a, a, a mixture of uh, performances on the stage. And for the most part, there were some audience members who didn't come because they didn't want to see that or they left because it was too loud. And there were also some people who came just to see the low anthem and they were not happy to hear Mozart. And uh, I heard some of their cat calls from the back of the room too. So that was really sort of awakening of like, okay. And this isn't a total kumbaya thing. You can't expect people to walk into a room who are expecting enchiladas and uh, be fed lasagna and be happy. So that's where I made sure from a publicity standpoint that our audiences always know what the next program is going to be. And so that they can really believe, they always believe in us that it's a fantastic show, but it, whether it fits their, their mold or not is up to them. Yeah, there's a, there's a term in political psychology called effective forecasting, forecasting errors. In oh, other yeah. words, people are going to expect to hate things way more than they really do. Yeah. And I think in classical music though, one of the things that I don't think we give ourselves enough credit for is that we're prepared to put stuff out there that we have really no idea what the audience reaction is going to be. I mean, we do it all the time in contemporary music and it's just, it's a, it's, it's been something that I, I agree with your, your overall statement, but it's been a journey for me too, to understand that changing genres, um, at least perceived genres is a really, is, is sometimes a bridge too far for some folks. This music though, that, that you curated a uh, Rob. So low anthem, Joe pug, Lizzie, no, all of these great musicians. Um, it was pretty low risk because their music is so great <laughs> and so soulful and, um, such a high level that the risk level was quite low in that regard. And so that's where, once again, it, I, it's testament to having colleagues in our midst that um, are given a long leash to choose what pieces they are really speaking to them. Most of the time when I sit in the audience for a downtown chamber series show, I have not heard the piece before. If it's not something that's common knowledge until I'm hearing it with the audience. And that's because I trust the musicians. I trust the visual artists. You've got to really trust people that if they are putting their best stuff out there, that it's going to work. So you said just a little bit ago that you're exerting a little bit more control over the programming than you used to. So if you could identify, like, how are you shepherding the series now in a way that you weren't before? There's always going to be a gravitational pull amongst musicians due to their specialty. So if you're 25 years old, you just got out of a music conservatory, you're, the type of music that you're excited about performing is going to be indicative of your instrument's rep. And uh, you might want to do more of that than the audience wants to hear. And there might be a, a lack of diversity in the program without somebody saying, you know, that amazing uh, soprano that you want to work with as a pianist. That's fantastic. And, but it's not going to be a full concert. It's too much soprano and piano. It'll be 15 minutes and I'm still going to pay you the full amount, but we're going to have other rep on the program as well to diversify it. Um, the only exception to that in recent years was our uh, concert master, Stephen Meckel of the Phoenix Symphony, who is a phenom. And he um, approached me and said, Mark, I'd like to do 
a complete cycle of all the Beethoven sonatas in one weekend. And I said, fabulous, let's do it. Scary to be having, going against some of my rules, just one composer, Beethoven, just two musicians, a pianist and a violinist, and then three shows in a row. Um, but knew that he could pull it off. And uh, each concert was a different set of sonatas. Some people came to all three shows. And uh, but then other different audiences came to each one of them, and it really worked. But that's testament to a certain type of player uh, that can really command the stage with that breath of rep mm -hmm. in a weekend. Tell me about some of the more recent forays into world music. So you had, we did a piece show a couple of years ago with an Afghani musician, and then you are had an African musician a couple weeks ago. Right. Right. Um, Phoenix is the fifth biggest city in the country. And because of that, we have resources that could easily be overlooked. And one of them is our immigrant culture. And um, whether it's folks who've been uh, refugee resettlement programs or a host of other things, um, I cast a wide web with the uh, record store here that I work with closely, Stinkweed's record store. And Kimber Lanning, once again, is the one who, that uh, person I mentioned, she owns that record store, uh, is very connected to the performing arts uh, scene and the bands and what shows are going on. And I basically rely on them. I say, look, I'm always down at the symphony giving concerts. I don't know what's coming through town. Just keep your uh, ear to the ground. Let me know who's here. Always have my ear out for uh, music that could fit into a chamber music setting, but that it's not clap. They go to those events and festivals and they've brought these names to me. So the one we just had um, uh, was a um, music from Burkina Faso, West Africa. And just this uh, Aruna, this uh, amazing musician who lives here in Phoenix, um, and when he's not touring around the world, and uh, put together a show of all African music. It was uh, heartbreaking because that concert occurred on the same day that uh, our state announced uh, a social distancing shutdown, where there was to be no gatherings more than 50. But that announcement came in the afternoon and the concert was that evening. And so we went ahead and held the concert. A lot of people did not come. We still had an audience of about 120. Uh, it was very awkward. Uh, everyone was very on edge. But um, I hope to have some video posted of that show soon so people can get a glimpse of what happened that night. Well, before we wrap up, Mark, I want to go from all this incredibly inspiring work um, to something a little bit more mundane and practical and just talk a little bit about the audition process for our orchestras as you've observed it from both obviously a candidate yourself and, but as someone that sat on the other side of the curtain a number of times and also as a proctor, when you were personnel manager, I just want you to like to give me some overview thoughts on that process and what some folks might take away from your wisdom on it. Well, to go back to the, I made an analogy to figure skating. Um, figure skaters have a, an asset that classical musicians don't, which is every time they come off the ice, they have a video of what they just skated. And if they were at a competition, they have a video of that. And they also can see videos of the people who were ahead of them or behind them in ranking. And so they're constantly being able to check in on their performance. And um, I use figure skating as an example because it's not something that's based on the stopwatch. It is artistic, although very technical. So it, classical musicians, we go to an audition and we leave there with emotions and results. Maybe we were advanced or maybe we didn't. Um, but we only know how we played. And so we basically are perpetually in the dark. And uh, we can record ourselves in our practice rooms or in secret when we're auditioning on stage to really find out how we played, but we don't know how the winner 
did. So that would be the first nut to crack. And there's several ways to go at it. Number one, get outside of your ego, get outside of your comfort zone, and play for as many people as you can during your training years. And most importantly, play for people that are not uh, specialized in your instrument. So if you're a cellist, play for winds and brass uh, because people get very siloed in their training and then their, how they are playing their excerpts just becomes indicative of their instrument rather than something that a conductor is probably listening to. Um, so getting outside of your bubble, playing for as many people as possible and having then having them be comfortable for playing for you, that way you are starting to really get an education for these separations that occur. It's one of the painful things to witness was that when I was auditioning, I really thought that the pack of people that auditioned were, you know, obviously there's some people who aren't prepared, but for the most part, everyone's kind of in the same bucket. If you have a good day or a bad day, it makes a big difference with your breakthrough to the finals, and then it's all real close. But when you're actually on the panel listening to people audition, it doesn't matter if there's 10 people auditioning or 100. It's usually the same. There's usually just two or three people that are way ahead of everybody else. And they really have a, a musicality, a uh, uh, a, a type of sound that really captures your heart and your attention that the others don't, regardless of where they're at technically on a good day or a bad day. And so then how do you become one of those three people? And how do you know who those three people are when you're in school? So once again, wherever you are, look where the high flyers are. And there might be people, regrettably, people that you don't like, people you don't get along with, people you're not drinking beers with on weekends. But maybe when you're sitting in an orchestra and you hear that bassoonist, you're like, wow, every time they have that solo, they, it's just really happening. Well, that's someone you want to have some extra money and you take that person out to lunch and you pick their brain and you listen to them and get feedback from them on your playing and then see if you can start to jump groups so that you are now in the running to be one of those three people, the people that are not just playing great at the audition and advancing, but the people that are winning the job. Hey man, look, I've known you for a long time and I really appreciate your high level view of things, your practicality, your can do spirit, your perseverance, and most of all your commitment to community. Uh, it's really inspiring work. And I, I look to you as one of the most interesting people in this business. So I appreciate you taking the time on this evening to sit down and talk to me about all this and I uh, appreciate all that you do. Likewise, Rob, you're inspirational. Thank you. Thank you for tuning into this first episode. The music you heard on the show is by Craig Wagner, an extraordinary guitarist from Louisville, Kentucky. Check out more of his stuff. We'll be back soon with more interviews. Our next episode features singer songwriter, Lizzie No. So please go ahead and hit subscribe.